Raymond Pierce is the Dean of North, Ca North Carolina Central Law School in Durham, North Carolina. Dean Pierce became Dean of North Carolina Central Law School in 2005, and prior to serving as Dean of the Law School, Ms. Pierce was a partner in the national firm of Baker and Hostetler from 1993 to 2000. Mr. Pierce served as President Bill Clinton's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education, where he managed the enforcement of civil rights laws and education and the development of federal civil rights education policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, I am currently the Dean of the School of Law at North Carolina Central University, one of only four historically black law schools accredited by the American Bar Association created during the days of apartheid and segregation. Prior to becoming Dean of the Law School, I served as the politically appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education in the Office for Civil Rights from the 2000, I'm sorry, from 1993 to 2000. Uh, clearly one of the first pressing matters to face the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Education at that time uh, was the recent decision by the United States Supreme Court some four or five months earlier in the Ayers v. Fordyce case that was mentioned by Dr. Richardson. And in that case, the United States Supreme Court set a new standard with respect to uh, states compliant with compliance with the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution as it relates to the education of African Americans attending historically black colleges and universities, not just in the state of Mississippi, but throughout the country. The, the concern expressed uh, by presidents of historically black colleges and universities and the civil rights organizations was what would be uh, the Clinton administration and the Department of Education's response uh, to that Supreme Court decision in light of the fact that the country had been uh, it, it, within a higher education desegregation docket, an effort of higher education desegregation docket back to the, going back to the 1970s that involved all 19 states in the United States of America that have publicly supported historically black colleges and universities. We took that Supreme Court decision and basically created, uh, upgraded the federal policy on higher education desegregation uh, to reflect what the United States Supreme Court said, which was basically that states have an affirmative duty to remove all vestiges of the past practice of segregation to the greatest extent practicable that have a present-day effect. Up to that time, we were operating up under, under the old 1978 higher education desegregation policy, which basically was a two-part policy uh, designed to remedy the past practice of segregation by enhancing and strengthening historically black institutions to provide them with the educational opportunities that heretofore had been constricted because of days of apartheid and segregation. Uh, with the new policy, the Office for Civil Rights then went forward uh, to enforce that policy by addressing those states that still had outstanding Title VI violations. Understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you have states, seven states right now uh, in this country that are continuing to receive f federal dollars for educational purposes, higher education, that are operating with outstanding Title VI violations. Title VI meaning uh, that law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, uh, color, or gender in entities receiving federal funds. Uh, I would question whether if there was a state in this country uh, receiving federal funds for environmental purposes, uh, and yet that state was in violation of federal environmental protection laws, if that state would still be able to receive federal funds uh, for, its environmental, for its environmental purposes. But that is what you have going on uh, here in our country. Um, by the time we left uh, the, the Department of Education in 2000, we had successfully negotiated a settlement agreements with all the remaining states consistent with the new policy, uh, settlement agreements that um, uh, included some hundreds of millions of dollars of increased funding, educational programs, partnership agreements, uh, quite a number of items that have been, for the most part, cooperatively entered into with the states and the federal government. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at the conclusion of our administration, it did not take long uh, for at least for me to begin to hear uh, uh, calls and cries that states were retreating uh, from those commitments, uh, so much to the point where you probably have uh, a, a clear case of a breach of contract between the federal government and states that had committed to doing certain things to bring their states in compliance with Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and address all concerns as enunciated by the Supreme Court with respect to the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Um, the the NAFIO group that has us assembled here today asked our law school, the North Carolina Central University School of Law, by the way, one of your members is a proud graduate of our law school, that's Congressman G.K. Butterfield, 
Um, Ignacio asked our law school if we would examine the current state of the law to determine whether or not litigation could be brought against the federal government's Office for Civil Rights to, to make the Office for Civil Rights enforce its own compliance agreements, understanding that that was what was done back in 1977 uh, to cause, at that time, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to get its Office for Civil Rights to actually enforce higher education desegregation policy. Our, our thought was that that would have to be done again. Unfortunately, uh, unfavorable decisions going back to uh, 1980 and going, I mean, 1989 and going forward have now made that uh, uh, difficult, almost impossible. Um, I believe that the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education has some outstanding career employees. I worked with them. I, I supervised them. I hired many of them. Uh, but it is clear to me uh, that the lack of enforcement of civil rights, federal civil rights uh, policy at the Department of Education is an agenda. Uh, it is because it is not high on the list. Uh, the action is not one and appreciated, and therefore states are beginning to retreat uh, from not only their commitments, but also engage in policies, educational policies, that are quite frankly adverse to the health and well-being of historically black colleges and universities. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask that uh, not only my testimony here, but um, uh, the statements of this panel, uh, which reference many documents that are contained in these appendixes, uh, be admitted uh, to the record. Thank you.